Yes, freeze! Principles are paramount to building a strong system of ethics. When you have weak principles, you easily lose sight of staying true to your core values. When that core is lost, people try to make the ends justify the means. People trade utilitarianism for principled virtues. People initiate violence because they think it justifies stopping some greater possible harm. It's okay to take your money if it means giving it to poor people. It's okay to force you to have an abortion if it means preventing overpopulation. It's okay to beat my son if it means he'll grow up to be a respectful adult. I was beaten as a kid and I turned out fine. Look at me. It's okay to have the government build a wall if it means we protect our culture. It's okay to take your land if it means using it for economic development. In libertarianism, it's important to remember that the goal is to maximize consent and minimize the initiation of violence. Don't be like the state and make exceptions to the foundations of liberty. Be true to your virtues. Yes, freeze! Is your child defiant, independent, annoyingly inquisitive? After a long, hard day of following the rules, who wants to deal with troublesome kids? 49% of children suffer from Oppositional Defiant Disorder, or ODD. Symptoms of ODD include independent thought, rampant creativity, and failure to submit to authority. But now there's a solution. The good people at Pilfer can help you with their time-release, once-daily capsule, Compliacin. Your child won't be able to form his own opinions, let alone express them. It maintains your child's ability to go to a state-run school and perform simple tasks around the house. You won't have to worry about parenting, and the school won't have to deal with your kid asking questions. Compliacin. You'll go from this. Quit telling me what to do! Quit telling me what to do! Quit telling me what to do! To this. Good morning, Mother. I love going to school. And this week we're learning all about how the government is our federal family and they're here to help us. Compliacin. Talk to your school psychiatrist and ask for it by name. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Peace Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network on theconsciousresistance.com and theseedsofliberty.com. The Peace Anarchism podcast is covered by the Bibcot No Government License. This allows for reuse by anyone except for governments and the agents thereof. You can find out more information for this at bipcot.org. So today we have the philosopher um, coming in from the United States. Uh, <laughs> you can find her on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and Steemit. Uh, so Steemit also the philosopher on Steemit? I assume? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, good. Um, so yeah, all those. Uh, mainly, mainly she's on um, YouTube and Facebook, though. Uh, I guess more on Facebook a little. The Philosopher. That's P H O. L O S O F P H E R, the philosopher, but of course pronounced the philosopher. So, uh, <laughs> so she makes some awesome videos um, about anarchy and volunteerism. So we'll talk about uh, a little bit about how she came to volunteerism, her path, what influenced her, what what um, um, podcast books personalities influenced her, as well as why she started the whole YouTube channel and Facebook page, and maybe delve into a couple of her. Uh, videos, one of them, a couple of them, like uh, on gun control, the minimum wage, um, how to learn Cantonese phrases, and uh, another one, why focus on principles. So those are some awesome topics. So um, thank you, <laughs> thanks a lot for coming on the show. Oh, no problem, Danilo. Thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw you on Anarchast, and it was awesome. Yeah. Because um, cool. I follow Jeff um, a lot, and I get a lot of inspiration. Same. About you know who to interview, and um, yeah, I've got some great guests from from watching his show, and um, yeah, and I saw you're a small channel, a small Facebook page, right? You just recently started, and I love supporting small channels and Facebook pages and podcasts because, or not yet a podcast, but um, because I, you know, we all were, were there, right? Just starting, and and it's nice to um, you know have a boost and you know help each other out, you know, when we can, so. I would yeah. say I would say the <laughs> the rising tide raises all boats. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, no problem. So, so please um, explain a little bit about your path to volunteerism. Uh, what got you interested in this philosophy? Oh, um, probably the two biggest influences. This was about a few years ago. Um, was uh, my boyfriend at the time. We'd been dating for like three or four years 
and also uh, Stefan Molyneux, probably. Um, my boyfriend introduced me to Stefan Molyneux uh, by just showing me a, a super long, like one hour Bitcoin video. I was like, what is this? This is so boring. And like, <laughs> it's like, why are we watching this? Like, it's, it's kind of funny how like my mindset has changed so much in my psychology. Um, but uh, I started listening to Stefan's Colin shows and, um, you know, it really resonated with me. A lot of listeners who would call in about their relationships with family and parents and friends, um, particularly the dysfunctional ones, uh, the ones that were shameful. And that really, you know, uh, spoke to me because I was going through a lot of the same thing. Um, and then within those Colin shows and watching other videos of his, because I got really interested in what this guy had to say, because he sounded uh, really logical and clear. Um, and he knew himself and understood like psychology and relationships. So I started on that whole path and voluntarism was, uh, how do I say it? it just, it just went along with it. Um, they pair really well together. So yeah, <laughs> that's how I started and discussing with my boyfriend at the time, like all the different things we were hearing from Stefan and what it means to be a voluntarist. And yeah, so <laughs> that's how I got started. Yeah, Stefan Manu was also a big uh, influence in my life as well, on my past, because um, when my son was born in 2010, my wife um, sent me a video of his, which was like um, 17 reasons why you shouldn't spank your child. Cool. And, That's awesome. And yeah, and so I started <clears throat> from that perspective, from the peaceful parenting perspective. Yeah. And then and then um, I absorbed everything else that he had on his channel, including voluntarism, wow. anarchism, and economics, and morality, and all that. Um, huh, I see. Wow. And it's interesting that before we had kids, um, I remember mm -hmm. talking to my wife and saying, um, "So if our if our child is is bad, we're gonna spank him, right?" And she's like, "Yeah, you know, we were spanked, yeah." But and and it's interesting right? that I didn't give it much yeah. thought. You know, like like I think it's easy for people <clears throat> to raise their kids the way they were raised because that's all they know. Of course, right? Yeah. And, yeah. and and if you don't give things much thought, you know, you're liable to commit the same mistakes. And so I'm very happy and grateful for Stefan Molyneux for discovering that. And uh, and so yeah. it doesn't matter how much I write, how many videos I make, um, how many likes I have on Facebook. My, my wife always likes to tell me, I got you into this stuff. It's it's because of me <laughs> that you're into this. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Is she into it too? Like, did she also um, go into the anarchy and not as not as deeply as I did? I'm much mm. more passionate. I did all the reading. I listened to all the podcasts. Um, she's more. Well, hey, the peaceful parenting is enough. <laughs> I think. Yeah, yeah, we're both on board with that definitely, and and the homeschooling yeah. basically, and the unschooling aspect, and and yeah, you know the. <clears throat> Basically, respecting the self ownership of children and you know circumcision, um, all that kind of stuff. So, so on that we're That's pretty great. much on the yeah. same page. And so, um, yeah, I am I'm grateful for her. <laughs> cool. That's awesome. <laughs> so, um, so yeah. So, why did you? Um, w what got you interested in 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 starting this YouTube channel? Um, you know, why did you name it that? Actually, well, maybe we'll start there. <laughs> oh, um, all right. Just threw a couple questions at me. I'll <laughs> <laughs> sorry. So no, you're fine. Don't be sorry. I'm just teasing. Um, so the name philosopher. I mean, I love philosophy. And if uh, you look at my page and like everywhere I post something, pretty much, I always sign off with like the philosopher. Philosophy is my core. Reason and evidence are my foundation. Um, that's great. I love and then I forgot the last part. I think it's like I love pho. Or no, no, sorry, pho <laughs> is my sustenance. Yes, something yes, about pho. That's it. So I seriously like I love pho. Ask any of my friends and family, they'll be like, yeah, Michelle, pho was like her go-to food like from childhood to now. So, uh -huh. um, and I love philosophy. So, philosopher, <laughs> um, I'm the philosopher and. Yeah, it was unique. No one else had it. Although, actually, I looked on Facebook. Someone did, but it wasn't the same thing as me. So it wasn't really, like, popular or anything. So I took it. <laughs> um, 
took it. So you, so, 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 so you, so you, I was gonna say, so you, you didn't ask for 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 what you get was it? Fuck per, that. Per, per, <laughs> permission. You don't you don't own a word. <laughs> I know exactly. Yeah. <laughs> come at me, um, come at me yeah. with everything you got. All right, go, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, uh, and then I started it because I just wanted to. I had a lot of um, things that I want to say, and I just wanted a way to share my ideas. Um, so yeah, I thought I would try making videos and uh, improve my public speaking <laughs> in the process. So yeah, I just want to help. Oh, sorry, I'll just finish. But like, I <laughs> like I just want to help. Uh, you know, spread liberty, um, and really admired all the people that had turned me on to liberty, like Stefan Molyneux, Adam Kokesh was one, um, Jeff Berwick. Uh, so yeah, Tom Woods now. So I just really admire what they're doing because um, it takes a lot of courage to do what you know what you're doing as well to speak about anarchy because you get a lot of vitriol thrown at you, um, and you can lose friends and strain relationships in the process um, just because you're you're bringing up topics that go against people's like foundations of what they were indoctrinated with as kids. So, um, so it takes a lot of courage, uh, but I think it's a necessary thing. And, um, after I learned about Liberty, uh, particularly voluntarism and what it means to, um, have consent in a relationship and, uh, beyond that too, like how to, um, have a good relationship with someone, someone, one where you're philosophical, you're honest. Like those were the virtues that I didn't really have modeled for me growing up as a kid. So when I discovered those, it was like my eyes opened and I was like, holy crap, there's this beautiful world of love, mm. like true love, like love based off of virtue, mm. based off of safety, not based off of, oh, well, you know, I've known you for so long, so that's why <laughs> mm. I love you. Mm. We have all these memories, but it's not based on character or anything. Um, so, yeah, and that's what I want to help spread because I'm really passionate about, um, you know, what learning about this stuff and particularly learning about myself and self-knowledge, which I always talk about, um, has done for me in terms of improving my relationships and my mental health. <laughs> so, yeah. Nice, nice. So it's it's been a self therapeutic uh, path, basically. It sounds like, um, and yeah, but yeah. With me yeah. as well, philosophy was a big part of my uh, um, intellectual development, even before I got into volunteerism. Like as a as a teenager in high school, I was very much into Eastern and Western philosophy, both. Um, mm -hmm. And so I read a lot of uh, like Schopenhauer, a little bit of Immanuel Kant, some Voltaire. Yeah. Aristotle, Plato, um, nice. yeah, about Socrates. Socrates didn't write anything, but then, uh, then I got into Eastern philosophy through um, the Lao Tzu, Dao Te Ching, and ah, and uh -huh. that's why um, after reading that book, I um, I that's why I studied acupuncture and Chinese herbs, and um, and Eastern nutrition, and, uh, and oh, then, I see, yeah, and and now, um, I've heard it mentioned that Lao Tzu is basically regarded as the first libertarian or anarchist. Kind yeah, of. I've heard that as well. Right. <laughs> <laughs> he he uh, held the individual above anything else instead of like society or the collective. So, Yeah, and, and uh, his reverence and respect for the natural order of things, for laissez-faire, for hands-off, you know. Um, right, one, yeah. One, one of his quotes is... Um, um, a ruler should rule the way you cook a small fish, right? Which is very, which is very lightly, right? Because if you if you're vig too vigorous with the fish, it will fall apart. So basically, <laughs> basically don't touch uh, it. Basically, right. don't touch it. Just let it <laughs> let it cook by itself. That's right? an interesting uh, metaphor analogy. Yeah, yeah, one of those. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but, <laughs> right. um, but yeah, that, that that kind of stuff, and and you know the idea of the Tao and how. You know, it's just, um, and, and, you know, the soft overcomes the hard um, and, you know, the idea of yielding and, you know, all these kinds of concepts, <clears throat> I think, are really parallel to volunteerism. 
in that yeah. uh, you know to me the soft overcomes the hard the soft meaning philosophy economics and morality which everyone everybody thinks you know what are what do those matter you know those are just concepts they're just they don't <laughs> exist you know why do we even need to talk about this stuff you know you know we focus on reality we need to we need to you know, make sure we elect somebody who's going to make a difference. <laughs> mm. <laughs> and so, yeah, so so basically philosophy was a big thing with me. And uh, and so it's funny because what you're talking about is reality. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And oh. and I did a post recently about that, specifically um, discussing that, saying that um, we all act based on our thoughts and philosophy and morality, right? So if you appeal to people's philosophy and morality, then you will necessarily change reality. You will change people's minds, people's paradigms. That's how you make true change, right? If you're just trying to elect another politician to do whatever you think he should do, you're just basically doing window dressing. You're 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 just superficial. It's just superficial changes, right? You're not affecting the minds of the people. That's what you need to focus on. You right. really want to make real change affect the minds of the people. Because again, um, you know, where does power come from? You know, people, you know, one thing, one um, criticism I get for people who, who criticize volunteerism, they say, well, if there's nobody, if you, you know, take away the ruler, it's just going to be chaos and then somebody's going to come to power and rule over you anyway. But then you have to figure out, wait a minute, where does power originate? It's not like this, it's not like a bunch of horses, but somebody just gets the reins and, you know, no. Everybody who pays attention to these people collectively, that's where the power originates, right? So that's why it's so important to appeal to the people and saying, you know what? Don't give these people your attention. Don't give them your, you know, go ahead. Sorry. That's a really good point you make about, no, you're good. Um, like the enablers, the mm -hmm. power comes from the enablers in mm -hmm. a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. Like if you look at um, like a in, a in an abusive relationship, you know, the enabler gives the abuser some power by staying in the relationship, mm -hmm. by still saying I love you and stuff like that. Like um, to the same extent, like it's the it's the tax slaves, the ones who say like rule over me, like there needs to be a government. They're the ones enabling the initiation of force. They're the ones who say taxation is necessary. Stealing from you is necessary. Oh, who cares if you get thrown in prison? Like, that's your punishment for not contributing to society. Like, these are the enablers, the people who vouch for it. So you're very right that the power comes from people's minds. And that's why we change people's minds so that they no longer support it. I mean, imagine if, if everybody... Um, and I guess I can't say everybody because there are those who are in power, but say everyone who's, you know, not in government power was like, you know what, fuck this. Like, I don't mm. want to, you know, support this system. You went to a war, like, using my money. I don't want to pay you anymore. Mm. Like, what if everyone did that? They wouldn't have that power anymore. Um, although it would be really bloody because they would probably, like, do everything they could uh, with, you know, their resources to <laughs> do something about it. Um, but, yeah. So well, you know that's an interesting, interesting idea. I, I don't necessarily well. This is this is why it's our job to do what we do, right? Because the more people that we can talk to and reach and um, <laughs> affect the way they think, the less um, rough and bloody the transition will be, right? Because um, you yeah. know you're right. The the uh, the people that you really do need to reach are the law enforcement officers and the soldiers, right? Because they're the they're the people that really provide the teeth for all these um, political scribbles, laws, rules, and regulations that uh, are flooding out of Washington, right? <laughs> um, but that's a lot easier said than done, true. that's for sure. Yeah. And, I mean, what I suggested as, every, as like a mass amount of people just rejecting it, mm. I mean, I don't know how realistic that would be. Um, definitely the transition to anarchy is one to be debated. <laughs> and yeah. that's a whole nother debate, Um and I think that's separate from the principles because it's hard to, you know, understand all the different uh, factors that could happen in a transition um, and like how we would go about, you know, dismantling government. Um, but I personally think and agree with the proposed like not for profit government model. I don't know if you've heard of that. No. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's not like. A really popular thing is just based on an article that I read from volcomic.com. Um, 
the person who makes the Voluntarius comic series. Have you heard of those? Yep. <laughs> cool. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Like, awesome yeah, comic books. Okay. No, he wrote a cool article about it. Um, mm-hmm. Just what the uh, what he thought was how we would transition, and um, it would first like be you know keeping not like the military and stuff like that um but first making taxation voluntary like that's the biggest part of it and then allowing people to compete with government services um but still having uh the i guess necessary like the institutions in place while we transition to a free market and allow the free market to innovate and catch up and for people to uh, compete. So government just becomes another business. Um, he calls it not for profit, but I just see it as another business because the only difference between a government and a business in my eyes, uh, or I guess in a really simplified way is one can force you to be its customer. One can force you to pay for its, uh, services, no matter how dissatisfied you are. Mm. And there's no recourse versus a business is like, oh, crap, in order for me to keep you as a customer, I need to please you or need to remediate any wrongs mm. that I've done to you. You know, so making taxation voluntary, I guess that's just the um, the number one thing about that transition model is uh, making taxation voluntary and, you know, allowing people with their wallets like they do now for other businesses, goods and services to vote with their money on what they think is necessary. So, you know, in that, um, if that was the case, like, I don't know how many people would, uh, you know, be voting for or like paying for the NSA. Like, oh, yeah, keep spying on me or something. Like, mm. mm-hmm. <laughs> so there's different things. Um, but yeah. Okay. So. Interesting. Um, yeah. So, Definitely, you know, I agree with you. What you what you say, you know, fundamental difference between the state and a, and a, and a private business is um, the idea of being voluntary, right? And if so, in, in this idea, um, if taxation is voluntary, the way I look at it, it's no longer called taxation. <laughs> it's called exactly. a fee. It's called exactly. it's called you know yeah. uh, a, the price <laughs> of a ser- yeah. of a good or a service. And right. and and also in this idea, I mean, I mean, it's kind of it's kind of convoluted because i mean okay okay so here's the way i look at it right i don't i don't really recognize that the state even exists right so the way i look at it is the idea it's the idea of statism that i am seeking to dismantle right i don't say to people we need to abolish the government right because fundamentally it's not really a government it's just people men and women forcing you to pay them people who believe they have an exemption to morality that we're all subject to right because if we believe that there's a separation me and the government are like damn they're the government and we're us what can we do you know and so but when you look at it you strip them away of their badge of their costume of their uniform their status and you say this is just a person believing they have power over me and and they don't right they they don't they have no legitimate power and so I kind of I kind of like it to look at it that way. Like it's it's more like Toto um, pulling you know the curtain of the, uh, the the Oz, the Wizard of Oz, right? <laughs> and seeing that it's just an old man, right. just an old man behind the curtain, right? It's bit, one big illusion that we all are supporting by our participation, right? And one uh, analogy that I like Stefan Molyneux made a while ago was um, um, people support the state in the same way that. It's like we're all blowing hot air and keeping a balloon up in the air, afloat, right? And all we have to do is stop blowing (laughs) and the balloon will fall down. Right. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. No, I get what you're saying. It's uh, part of it's a concept, but that's, I think that's just the first step. There definitely has to be a transition. Right. Uh, But yeah. So, um, and, and the other thing is, um, yeah, so the idea of it being, um, you know, w- will it be violent at, at all? You know, I just tell people, I think what you need to do, like, like first of all, I'm not an, I'm not an anarchist or a voluntarist because, um, um, let's say, because I'm certain that there will be a voluntary society. Well, actually, I'm pretty certain, but not because I'm certain <laughs> that I know the future, but just because that this is a moral and compassionate way to live, right? I'm living based on principles. That's it. Right. I don't need to know the future. I don't need to know 
um, how the poor would be fed or, or how, you know, sick people would be taken care of uh, without the state. I just know that taxation is theft and there's no such thing as legitimate ruler and the belief in authority is a lie. <laughs> That's all I need to know, right? And, mm. uh, and you know, and voluntary interactions and free market is what produces the maximum amount of prosperity because it's, and, and incidentally, it's all, is also the most moral. <laughs> so, right. so that's basically, um, the primary thing. So when I tell people, um, you know, they're like, what, what can I do, if, you know, to bring about the most amount of freedom? I'm like, just live your life. Forget about they even exist. Just forget about they even exist. Live your life in a moral, decent, humane, compassionate way. Raise your kids to be that way. Um, and disregard the state, you know, you know, um, avoid taxes wherever possible, you know, um, um, live an agorist lifestyle, have a business outside of the state, raise your kids outside of the state, transact outside of the state, do everything you can, you know, have your, have your wealth outside of the state, do everything you can to starve the beast, starve it of your participation and starve it of your currency. And I think, that is the most that is the best way to have a the most peaceful <laughs> you know no assassination no coup no rebellion no revolution necessary right it's just an illusion that's the way i look at it mhm yeah i'd add also like uh through your personal relationships like spread why you're doing what you're doing and just like you're doing now like why the state is illegitimate it's right. an illegitimate concept so yeah <laughs> yeah, and I have to sometimes when I meet some new people. Um, I, I mean, I I homeschool my kids, so I'm, I'm meeting up with a lot of homeschooling mothers all the time, and uh, so they're already critical of government school, which is nice. So I have like a foot in the door with them. So I'm like, all right, so if the government <laughs> can do education right, what do you think they? What else can't they do right? What do you think? <laughs> right. I think getting to why government can't do it right is really important, though to help people understand and it took me a while of just you know like hmm why like why would there be a defense agency in a free market like mm -hmm. why mm -hmm. you know um and it all comes down to self-interest and incentive um and when you have government which is a monopoly on force mm -hmm. the incentive structure changes and that's why you know things that the government does is all like fucked up because mm -hmm. they mess up the incentive structure mm -hmm. um so yeah and that's why you have like crony capitalism which is not actual capitalism mm -hmm. um it's you know government regulations mixed with capitalism which actually creates a monopoly mm -hmm. um so yeah so but i uh i think that's really important to convey as well <laughs> yeah, yeah, I remember um this guy on Facebook Daniel Rothschild um that uh said um you know, I don't like I don't like crony capitalism because, you know, people hear all they hear is capitalism. Oh, that's capitalism. Ah, that's why that's the reason that this country is so messed up. You see, you're capitalism. Yeah. yeah and we're like, no, 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 no. It's crony. You missed the crony part. And so what he says is basically like saying crony capitalism is like saying crony lovemaking. Like rape is crony lovemaking. No, just call it rape. Because <laughs> they say a whole different That's word. A good point. So, so we, we shouldn't mix the two. So we good should rather point. say maybe <laughs> instead we should we could describe it as corporate fascism. That's maybe a more apt description of how things are right, right now. You yeah. know? So crony capitalism is it's confusing to people too much. Because you know? then we have to redefine. Yeah, that makes sense. You know, got to redefine. That's a good point. Yeah. Um, right. So, so so let's talk a little bit about maybe a minimum wage. I love that topic. Um, <laughs> one of my favorite topics. Um, so what did you... Love it. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So, so what did you say in your video and, and what are your thoughts on it? Oh, um, well, in my video, I brought up a couple points like how uh, minimum wage um, actually increases the cost of a good or service down to the consumer. So... Um, it's not like it doesn't, you know, it doesn't, I didn't say this in the video, but it doesn't take into account like, you know, what an owner spending on R and D, um, all they focus on is like, oh, the CEO makes this much money. Mm. And if he gave, you know, a dollar to everyone, then, you know, whatever mm. they would have a dollar raise or something, but they don't see that that's, let's say it's like. 100,000 employees and he makes $100,000 or something. They're like, that's $100,000 he doesn't need. He could give it to the employees. <laughs> um, but it's like, 
you know, one, what value are, are you providing? Are you worth that $15 an hour? Like if you are, then go find a job where you can. Uh, there's a lot of people who make well above the minimum wage based off of the value they provide. Um, so there's only, you know, people who make, uh, who don't provide that much value, who, you know, provide value below the minimum wage, whatever it is. Um, yeah, they just don't, <laughs> I lost my train of thought, but they just, uh, it's it's funny because they can't like just go somewhere else like and advocate for their service um mm. and also uh i brought up the point that the real minimum wage is zero dollars um mm -hmm. and this is related to what i was just saying uh it's zero dollars because that's how much you make when you don't get a job because let's say you're worth eight dollars an hour and the state forces everyone to pay $15 minimum wage, if you don't have the skills to make 15, the employer is not going to choose you. They're going to choose someone with more experience. So it actually decreases the number of jobs um, and also raises the cost of goods and services as well, like I said. Um, and it's also fallacious because I, I brought this up in the video too, like, um, you know, if the minimum wage really created wealth, uh, then why don't, instead of giving foreign aid to other countries, why don't we just tell them to raise the minimum wage? Like, why don't we just say, hey, do what we did, raise the minimum wage, you know, but we don't. We give them, like, tons and tons of money <laughs> in foreign aid. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. That doesn't actually get and to... Bernie the... Sanders, too. <laughs> oh, sorry, what? No, what were you going to say? Bernie Sanders? I was just going to say, and Bernie Sanders is a hypocrite, too. Like, if you look at a lot of status and their policies or... Um, you can find what's fallacious by looking at the hypocrisy. So, mm -hmm. it, like, for example, like Bernie Sanders, like, we need a $15 minimum wage. Like, that's what we need. That's the cost of living. And then he has interns that he pays $12 an hour. Like, <laughs> like you know, right, right. <laughs> like, I'm just like, that's the hypocrisy. Right. Um, or, you know, the leftists, like, they're just like, uh, when before Trump won, and in the debates with Trump and Hillary, um, uh, and uh, the moderator asked Trump a question like, are you going to accept the results of this you know, election? Um, you know, whatever happens if you don't win. He's like, I would only accept it if I win. <laughs> so he was implying that the polls could be rigged by Hillary. And there's like been a lot of evidence of that through WikiLeaks mm. and like, you know, mm. George Soros. Um, and... Uh, <laughs> So it's funny. Uh, and then a lot of leftists were like, oh, my gosh, you would question it. This is our democratic process. This is how it is. It's fair, whatever, you know. And then as soon as Trump wins, they're like, oh, my God, are you fucking kidding me? Like, and they call for secession. And, you know, it's just really silly. They just they only make moral arguments and principled arguments when it's fitting for them. But when it's not fitting for them, when it goes against, you know, like their best interest, they then advocate against it. So you can see this in a lot of places <laughs> where it's a fallacious philosophy. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah. <laughs> so, it's, so when I talk about the, um, no problem, no problem. <laughs> um, so, yes. When I talk about the minimum wage with people, I, I uh, talk about Walter Block's uh, quote, which is, it's not a mandatory employment law it's a mandatory unemployment law because it doesn't guarantee <laughs> anyone is going to have a job and like you said all it does is create a um a, a, a group of people that are automatically unemployed because they were priced yeah. out of the job market right like you exactly. said they are not worth that amount of currency per hour right, right. It, 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 it's like it, it, people think that you know what you get paid is so arbitrary like let's just pay you fifty dollars an hour <laughs> <laughs> right. Like no, exactly. there's a specific there's a specific reason why you're getting paid seven dollars an hour because if you could if you could get paid ten then you would get paid ten but since you can't right. then you're getting paid seven so <laughs> exactly like these people don't know what ROI is they don't know what return on investment means right. you know they don't even think about that like hmm why does the programmer who actually codes your app make a lot more than you know the person cleaning the toilets. <laughs> 
Uh, well, let's look at the ROI. Maybe because the person who programs the app is going to generate more money for you. Right. So it's, yeah. Right, right, yeah. And um, and basically, yeah, what it does is just um, cuts off the bottom rungs of the ladder, right? So so people who get out of high school, yeah. which is kind of interesting, actually, you think about think about government school, like, you know, they say it's so wonderful. We need to give our kids a broad education. Twelve years, fifteen thousand hours oh, of God, it's so government bad. indoctrination, <laughs> and all these yeah. kids can do is flip burgers, or work at KFC, or work at Home Depot, or Dunkin' Donuts, or whatever Starbucks. You know, right. that's all they're worth in the job market after fifteen thousand hours and twelve years. What a tragedy, right? Imagine if you had the freedom to choose what you wanted to study. For, yeah. for 12 years, how many things could you be, could you master if on your own? <laughs> how many skills would you have? And you'd be making a lot more money a lot quicker um, because you wouldn't have to memorize worthless bits of information. <laughs> right. I, I mean, you know, one can make the argument like, oh, well, you know, they, we teach our kids like STEM and Common Core is a good thing. We're going to teach our kids the skills that are valuable in the job market, like programming. All kids need to learn programming. Like, you know, so one could make that argument. But uh, what they forget is what does the child want, you know, and how much does one retain when they're forced to learn something? I mean, ask ask anyone who hated math in school. Ask them, like, you know, the different terms. Do they remember? No, other than the basic math that they use on a daily basis, you know. They don't remember. They don't remember uh, derivatives. They don't remember, like, <laughs> like I'm, I'm, I'm even trying to. <laughs> I can't remember. Like, what's the limit of N as it goes to infinity or some stupid shit like that? Like, I'd, I've never used that again. I passed the test. I got an A, but I never <laughs> use that again. There's, no, It's not applicable. Um, I don't retain it, like, you know, compare that to somebody who uh, studied, you know, math or something on their own out of interest. They retain it so much better. Um, so, yeah. Oh, yeah. So I think the key is, you know, the child, like, what do they want to know? And, um, like, just imagine, like, you brought up how you said, you know, how many skills could they master by now? Even if they mastered one skill, one one skill or one hobby they got really good at that would be better than what is now mm. where their minds so scattered they're shamed into you know the system where if you don't get grades and these topics that someone arbitrary arbitrarily determined that you need to know um you know they're in this mindset they come out with no passions they never uh you know, discovered what it was. Um, I was actually listening to listening to a podcast with Stefan Molyneux and uh, what was his name? I was like, I should, I should send it to you. It was pretty good. Um, or I guess, sorry, I'm remembering a different conversation. He actually just had a, a call in show with some random person who called in um, and asked about how they should uh, homeschool their kid or if they should send their kid to public school. Mm -hmm. So this was where he was talking about it. Um, and he talked about how in the, the current public school system, kids don't have a chance because they're, they're constantly being crammed like 40 hours a week, actually plus, you know, there's going to school eight hours a day plus the homework <laughs> and the studying. Oh my gosh. It's like more than a full-time job in a lot of ways. And mm -hmm. you're, it's unpaid. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and it's not voluntary. So, but he brought up a really good point that stayed with me that kids don't get this aha moment. They don't get this moment where they're like, oh, I love the guitar. I'm going to spend all my time doing this, mm -hmm. you know, cause I, I love it or I love programming. Um, this is what I love. This is my joy, you know, because they're crammed all the time and forced to do this. They don't have that time to discover what it is. Um, and even when they do, they don't get the time to indulge in it because it's like, here's what you need to read. Here's what you need to study next. Then they're so tired out from school. And also not to mention, you know, a whole different thing, the social side of school being with other little kids who may be from dysfunctional homes, you know, and all that like bullying and that sort of environment. Like mm. there's a lot. <laughs> school is a public government public school is evil. I mean, 
just what it does to a human being who's naturally curious. It, it just destroys their curiosity just because you're slamming them for 12 years, like you said, like uh, 40 plus hours a week. Maybe you get this, you know, you get the summers off or whatever, um, just with all this like crap saying that you need to know this. And if, oh, you're not trying hard enough to know this, what's wrong with you? We need to do an intervention kind of thing. And it's like, Jesus, I just don't like this shit. Like, <laughs> you know, so yeah, that's the. Right. A- yeah, that's how horrendous it is. And um, if you just look at a lot of people who graduate high school and college, like, just look how similar they are. Compare that to, I've, I was looking at interviews of people from like a Sudsbury school. Right. I think yeah. we talked about this. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Where, yeah, at this, um, like, I would love to open one, but it's like uh, the school where people, um, there, there are some adults, but there's no like curriculum. It's not like, okay, you got to learn this, move on next period. It's just, hey, here's a bunch of resources. Here's books. You can go outside, do whatever you want. Mm-hmm. And the kids decide. Mm-hmm. Some kids just play video games. You know, some kids read, some kids cook, mm-hmm. but they're choosing what they want to do. And I, I saw some interviews of uh, graduates of Sudsbury School. And the one common thread that I notice between all of them is they had this sort of aha moment. They found what they were interested in. They found the hobby or the thing that would get them up in the morning, Mm -hmm. you know, Mm. and versus now like, Oh, I got to go to McDonald's like with my (laughs) language arts degree, like, (laughs) Oh God, so happy life right now. You know, (laughs) like I just compare it like all these people, like I saw one guy, he was like, all I did was play piano in Sudsbury school. And he got accepted to a really nice, um, music school playing piano professionally. He didn't really know how to read music because he always just learned how to do it by himself. Just listening. Um, but later he learned how to read music when it was necessary. You know what I mean? But he learned to love the music first and that's the key. Or this other chick, like she was really into horses mm-hmm. and at the Sudsbury school, she'd bring her horse and she'd ride around. They had, they have a lot of land. <laughs> so mm-hmm. she'd ride around the whole place and that's what she would do. Um, and when she graduated, she just worked for a small business that dealt with horses. Mm-hmm. And then she, kept moving up because she learned how to build rapport Mm -hmm. with her managers. Um, She had an opportunity where they were like, Hey, this manager's leaving. Do you want to be the manager? And she's like, Oh shit. Like I don't (laughs) have the experience. Like you can do it. So she had to learn and grow on the job. Awesome. Uh, And then she moved up again. So, you know, that's an example. Um, People don't get these skills because they don't, they're not allowed to follow their passions in school. And it's really sad. Like if you think of the, God, millions, billions of people who are put through public school not allowed to pursue their passions. I'm not saying everybody, because some people, you know, some people, they, uh, I would say it's a minority. There is something at school that they just enjoy doing, or um, some people just like challenging themselves and learning anything. So they just so happen to luckily be interested in the curriculum just because they love learning just for the ch- hell of it, just for the challenge. Um, but most people don't. Most people would rather be doing something that they love. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. And I would, I would, um, oh, awesome. <laughs> Everything you said was <laughs> awesome. Yeah. I love that school too. Um, I, I heard about it. I read about it. I uh, saw a couple of videos about it. Yeah. Really cool. Um, and when I talk to people about this, um, well, first of all, I say you can't really call what you learn, or what you let's see, what you retain in government school as being learned. Like you can't call that learn. Learning is voluntary. Learning, you do something because you love to do it. When it's involuntary, it's called indoctrination. <laughs> if you're punished for not doing it, that's what that is. Learning is what you do when you love to do it. And for me. The most valuable things I re- I remember and appreciate from school was stuff that I learned outside of school. <laughs> Everything else, like the philosophy, as, uh, uh, astronomy, cosmology, theoretical physics, chess, piano, um, all that stuff. Uh, alternative medicine I was le- reading about too, juicing, um, all of that outside of school. I'm like, I, I-, I had no desire to excel and get the highest grades and, you know, be top of my class. No, all I wanted to do was make sure I, you know, I was average and passed. So I had enough time to do what I really wanted to do. (laughs) Yeah. Right. (laughs) 
and I, w- I wish go, I yeah. did that. <laughs> I was, uh, as you know, I'm too much of a perfectionist. So I was like, I gotta get a a press a press all the time. <laughs> so oh, really? Oh, that you... was like, yeah, no, that was like my focus in school. I was like, you know, what you would the the perfectionist, the one like you notice those kids some kids like they had to get a pluses no matter what and i had some friends like that too where mm. if they got an a minus they would be sad mm. and that was one of them wow. <laughs> we'd be like oh we got a minus like you know <laughs> like it's just um you know some people don't handle it very well right. i did notice some people they were just like oh, i'm just gonna pass like they figured it out they're like fuck this like i'm just gonna do the minimum and pass right, right, i have right. to be here right right but some people are like i need to prove myself <laughs> i need to get the a if i get all a's that means i'm something yeah. like i totally fed into the, exactly. the bullshit exactly. <laughs> so. and then there's a there's a, a video i don't know if you're uh, familiar with josie wales um uh she worked with larkin rose and so she has a, a yeah, Josie the Outlaw, right? So, so she has a YouTube oh, channel, okay. yeah, YouTube channel, Josie the Outlaw, and so she, one of her videos is called um, "A Prison by Any Other Name," right? And so it draws parallels between uh, government school and prison. You know, right? fascinating, uh, excellent video, uh, video. You know, you know the bells. Yeah, she um, has some good stuff. I wish yeah. she'd do something recent. It's been a, it's been a while. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess been she's been busy like me. <laughs> I guess she's been inactive, but. Um, but yeah, um, so I guess really quick before we finish up, maybe talk a little bit about the other one, the why focus on principles, and then then we'll wrap up. Okay, um, so yeah, this video um, I partially liked it because I like acting. <laughs> partially, <laughs> I mean, like I'm saying, I partially like the video. I really like acting. Oh, um, okay. And so I got to make it. <laughs> yeah. And I, so I liked making accents and like making fun of a hillbilly or something. Um, but no, this video, uh, basically I talk about why it's important to focus on principles. Um, but I guess a precursor to that is develop principles, <laughs> develop sound, consistent principles that you can apply, uh, universally. So like nonviolence, that's a principle that all voluntarists strive to spread and universalize. And, you know, they say all human interactions should be voluntary. Mm. That's a principle. There are no exceptions. Mm. There are no exceptions to principles. Um, if you make an exception to a stated principle, you can't claim to have that principle. Um, now, there is a difference, though, when it comes to pragmatism. Uh, for example, voting for Donald Trump over Hillary, you know, just to stop her, mm. because pragmatically, you think that, you know, he would stop her. Um, that's a little different. Uh, but when it comes to voicing, you know, the exception, that's when you can't claim that you have a principle. And um, it's really important because w- if you make exceptions to principles, you then develop all these different excuses, and suddenly the ends justifies the means. Um, and that's a terrible. Um, I forgot what I called it. It's kind of, you could say it's a principle or a rule, but um, it can't be applied universally. Like, cause you wouldn't do that for yourself. Like if you said the ends justifies the means. So what does that mean? The ends, you know, mm-hmm. like you, you steal from me or something, but, and you're richer. So that's the end. So you're richer. And mm-hmm. like, that justifies the means of you stealing money from me. Um, you could like, it, it's not a sound consistent principle, if that makes sense. I don't know if that was a good example, um, <laughs> but I'm trying, I'm yeah. trying to show that <laughs> a sound principle could be uh, universally applied. So no, I thought that was fine. Yeah. It has to be universalizable, right? Um, as Stefan Manu would say, you know, I guess universal, what's it called? Um, UPB universal, um, universally preferable, preferable behavior preferable yeah. behavior right right like um, right. you know like 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 he says you know we can't all live in a world where we're all um stealing from each other and we're all you know assaulting each other but we can live in a world where we're all interacting voluntarily with each other right that's entirely possible right so, i like what he called it um like he wasn't necessarily saying morality is like objective like there's good and i can show it to you um, I like how he called it universally preferable behavior. Basically, it's what's what behavior is preferable that all humans can agree with is preferable. 
like unless you're a masochist and you have some sort of dysfunction <laughs> like you're gonna agree that it's preferable you don't get raped or beaten against your consent mm. you know but but uh even then i guess the masochist <laughs> this is me maybe over philosophizing but <laughs> they consented in that situation so whatever um so but if you say like consent is the principle all human interactions should be voluntary, then that's the key part that can definitely be uh, applied universally. I don't know of anyone, even a masochist, who would be like, oh, yeah, I don't, you know, I think it's good if you just do things to me without my consent, even when I don't want, just do it. Right. You know, like, um, and one, you know, one could argue and be like, well, if someone likes rape, then... <laughs> But it's like, no. It, then it's not called if rape. like it, it's not rape. Right, exactly. exactly. Yeah, so, right. That's the thing. Um, philosophy is fun. You <laughs> define your terms and shit. But yeah, so... <laughs> that's why I like philosophy. Yeah, so that's, what we do, <laughs> that's what we do on this show. We define our terms and shit. So, very important. Right. <laughs> and shit. And we shit. define shit. And very important. We define terms and shit. And shit. Like poop comes out your butt. Anyway. Definitions. <laughs> <laughs> Definitions are vital. Um... <laughs> but um yeah 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 that's uh, you know I, I just want to tell you one thing um i i have a, a relative who is a mathematician and i was ta i was explaining to him about volunteerism and um and i was saying that um the principles that we're espousing were not created they were not um like like laws and regulations just written down and created by people these are discovered as being universal um, laws of morality and uh, like you said it's not to say that they're you know objective it's just they're universal in the sense that um, like it, like you know, like laws of physics are discovered laws of planetary motion are discovered laws of mathematics are discovered now you can have people that practice bad mathematics but that doesn't invalidate the existence of the laws of mathematics in the same way you can have people that are criminals and that consistently violate self ownership of other people, but that doesn't that doesn't mean that there are no laws of ma of morality, right? So all they're doing is violating the self ownership of people and their property rights, right? So that was kind of a, an interesting argument, a discussion I was having with him because him being a mathematician, he was like, no, there's specific laws of mathematics, but there's not specific laws of morality, <laughs> and and so yeah, so that's, that's honestly that's a hard one for me. Like maybe it's because I'm super literal. Mm -hmm. Like oh, here's a pink sticky note. Anyway, <laughs> like maybe, <laughs> and I'm also random, but like no maybe problem. you know I'm super literal, but it's hard for me to you know understand if like what the laws of morality are. Um, that's why I do like, you know, saying universally preferable because mm. that's what I can see that manifests mm. in reality for me that universally this behavior consent is preferred by everybody. Um, right. So, yeah. Right. So going along with that. So that's the golden rule, which is, um, you know, do unto others as you would have done unto yourself. But um, as uh, Dave Painter from the Seas of Liberty told me, um, <laughs> like you said, a masochist might like to be... Um, put in a slave relationship and a lot of people wouldn't like that right so then you have to amend that and say well maybe it's the silver you should use a silver rule which is don't do to others what they don't want to be done or, or what you mm -hmm. or what you wouldn't want done to yourself so mm -hmm. <laughs> or yeah so, something like that so it's, it's, an, it's the, yeah. neg the negative of that um but yeah you know you get the general idea i mean i think i think right. most people are not sociopaths most people are not masochists most people are kind of um even keeled you know understand basic laws of morality you know most right. people are decent but people we, Go ahead. yeah Go ahead. but we have to know there are people like that so there is a limitation to the golden rule <laughs> true yeah yeah good point but, yeah. um all right so um i don't want to keep you any longer so um please reiterate your your contact information if they want to follow your work. Oh, okay. Um, so you can find me on facebook.com slash DA, <laughs> like duh, because the was taken, and then philosopher, so like philosopher but with an O instead of an I. Um, same thing with Twitter, it's duh, philosopher. And then my YouTube is just a bunch of gibberish. But you can find all the links on my Facebook page. Um, even if you just do a search for the philosopher, it should come up um, my page, and then within that are all my different links to like Twitter and YouTube. So yeah. <laughs>
Awesome. Yes. Please visit her YouTube or Facebook. Give her a like, subscribe, like all her videos. She's putting out some good stuff. We need more <laughs> of this kind of, um, we need more liberty and volunteer speakers um, to promote the message because it's such an awesome message. That's true. And I think it will transform the world. Um, so what, one more thing before we go, I like to ask all my guests, uh, what is your, your fa favorite quote of all time? Oh shit, that's hard. <laughs> I, I like to. Yeah, I, that's I, I, it. I like, I like that was my it. favorite quote of all time. <laughs> <laughs> it's just oh shit. Though. Nice, I like that. <laughs> Dude, there's like, oh man. I like to catch people off guard. That's my thing. <laughs> yeah. What do you, you think? What do you think? This is going to be an easy conversation? Is that what you thought? Yeah. What the hell, Danilo? <laughs> I decided for this. <laughs> um, <laughs> Goddamn Mongolians break down my shitty wall. That's my favorite quote. No, I'm just kidding. It's like some random thing. It's like not philosophical. No, I'm just kidding. Um, the philosopher has uh, spoken. <laughs> just uh. What Fuck. Oh, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I just have so many. I mean, love yeah. is an involuntary response to virtue. Nice. Um, reason plus virtue equals happiness. The first step to knowledge is to know thyself. Nice, nice. Um, yeah. <laughs> All right. I, I assume. Uh, so, so the uh, the second one is that Stefan Molyneux quote. Reason or is that Aristotle? Or is that Aristotle? Second one, I believe that's Aristotle. Cool. The first one was Stefan. The third one is Socrates. I believe the first step to knowledge is to know thyself. I think that's Socrates. Beautiful. So, so have you read any any <laughs> yeah, of the? There's... Have you read any of the um like the um the Greek philosophical texts? Any of them? Like 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 the Republic. Um, I've listened to some like a. Uh, I think I listened to a reading of I forgot it was like Socrates trial by Plato mm. I forgot um, but no I haven't read extensively so I need to there's like I have a gajillion like I even have a sticky <laughs> note where I'm like all right I gotta read nice. I gotta read Mises human action nice. Rothbard you, you still use sticky notes Lover. what hell yeah I who, love sticky notes who uses sticky notes? you got your phone you got the notepad man <laughs> Interesting. All right. It's, it's because when I'm done with a task, I'm like, uh -huh. throw it in the, you know, right. I don't know. It's satisfaction. A it's a feel, yeah, a feeling of satisfaction of accomplishment, right? <laughs> right. Nice. Exactly. All right. All right. You can't. So, you can't. Too many that. books to read. Yes. Oh, well, you I don't know. know. Maybe I should read a Greek book. No, it's, it's kind of okay. heavy. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's uh, it is what it is. What do you? What, uh, yeah, I read um, Plato Republic. I read uh, our, um. I think Aristotle and Nicomachean Ethics. Uh, wow. I read... Aren't those like really long, heavy texts? Um, play, um, the Republic, um, yeah, it's a good, I don't know, two, three hundred pages. I, I I loved it so much, I read it maybe okay. two or three times, um, which oh, I very cool. I very rarely do. Um, uh, <laughs> but, I have to write it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's the most played really? the famous thing. And then, uh, <clears throat> and then there was like... Um, that he wrote, he wrote something that Tim, Timius, yeah, like um, I think it was like yeah, chronicling uh, the, the Socrates trial, and yeah, um, right, uh, yeah, I think that's about it. Um, but yeah, I yeah, wish but... Socrates wrote, but he couldn't. He was too busy like lecturing, and yeah. people could only write down what he said. But it'd be cool to hear his his own voice, right. you know, through the words. But yeah, and, and right I... now I'm just reading. Oh, sorry. And I was, gonna, Go I was just going to say, you just reminded me of Socrates because um, he was described as the philosopher, I think, by his, his uh, you know, uh, people who <laughs> came after him. Like, just the philosopher. That's all. That, that's how they described him. So, oh, really? That's I, just, cool. I, just, I made the connection. So you stole his uh, intellectual property. So uh, shame on you. <laughs> <laughs> but I wasn't even trying to. doesn't matter. <laughs> we, uh, we gave the government money. And right. That's why we own it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, it's, it's okay. I'm sure. I'm sure he approves in his grave. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, to be fair, I wrote foe. Exactly. So foe. You changed it. So you changed it. It's all right. <laughs> <laughs> you added. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, awesome conversation. Um, so everyone, yeah, too. <laughs> please, everyone, check out her um, her pages: Facebook, YouTube, um, Twitter, uh, Steemit, 
and uh, follow her and, uh, you know, like her post because, um, you know, we need to help each other. And uh, like I said, r- rising tide raises all boats. You know, we have to help each other spread our, you know, messages because um, I think they will truly transform the future for the better. Um, Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> she said spread, so... <laughs> <laughs> it's it's getting late. Yeah, it's, it's all right. <laughs> I'm um, delirious. Yeah, so if anybody <laughs> wants to follow me, you can do so on um, P- uh, Bitcoin, Patreon, or PayPal. Links are below. That's patreon.com slash peaceful anarchism to help me out. Uh, dollar show is all I ask. Uh, I love to interview fascinating people like the philosopher here, and I want to do more of it. And monetary compensation is always appreciated and encouraged because in the end, we respond to incentives, right? We're, we're capitalists in the end, so we <laughs> respond to incentives like anybody. And even though I put these videos out for free, um, the time is not free. There's always opportunity cost to everything you do, right? There's always something else you could have been doing. And so there's opportunity cost with everything you do. So please help me out if you want to continue to uh, see more of this stuff. So um, thank you very much for a wonderful conversation. Uh, this is Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network on theseasofliberty.com and theconsciousresistance.com. Wishing everyone have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye. Bye, Danilo. <laughs> Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this content and would like to see more of it, please feel free to donate and help me interview other fascinating people. You can do so through Patreon. That's patreon.com slash peaceful anarchism to help me out. A dollar a show is all I ask. If you feel so inclined to donate more, please feel free. It will only assist me in spreading the message of freedom and volunteerism that much farther and that much more efficiently. You can also donate to my Bitcoin My Bitcoin address is in the description to my videos as well as on my website, peacefulanarchism.com. And while you're on my site, there's a donate button to donate through PayPal. If you prefer to donate through PayPal, you can do so with that. But Patreon is a little bit easier for content creators as you can set up a recurring donation if you so desire. Also, while you're on my website, peacefulanarchism.com, please feel free to sign up, enter your email address, Sign up for my newsletter and you will receive updates every time I post something, a video or an interview. I do not send out any spam. Or you can also follow me on Facebook under facebook.com slash peaceful anarchism or facebook.com slash Danilo Cuellar 3, I believe. Danilo Cuellar 3. So either, either one of those methods, if you are able to donate, I would be most appreciative. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you have a magnificent day. Cell 411 is a free app for Android and iOS that replaces government-controlled 911. Cell 411 allows you to preset a group of friends or private organizations to show up in any emergency. Cell 411 is a nightmare for the state because it proves their so-called services aren't needed. Cell 411 has had thousands of installs, and of course it's covered by the Bipcot No Government License. Cell 411 because your friends won't shoot you when you're in trouble. Without the government, who would build the emergency services? You and Cell 411. Get it today at GetCell411.com. That's GetCell411.com.